Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. Welcome to a very special program. Tonight, some of New York City's historic preservation organizations are pleased to bring you a conversation with two of our guiding lights, Roberta Brandis Gratz and Anthony C. Wood, about the growth of our city's preservation movement and the guardian angels who made it all, all possible, the J.M. Kaplan Fund and Joan K. Davidson. It would not be hyperbolic to say that without the supporting hand of the fund, guided by Joan's vision, dedication, and energy, many of our city's historic neighborhoods and sites would not exist today, at least not in the state that we know them. It may be true that cities don't get built, built in a day, but it's certain that saving them takes years of effort and hundreds of hands. Before I introduce our stars, uh, a word about our sponsors. We are thrilled this evening is a, co a collaborative effort between amongst five preservation organizations. Since 1893, the Historic Districts Council, uh, since 1893, the Municipal Arts Society of New York has lifted up the voices of the people in the debates that shape New York's built environment leading the way to a more livable city from, sky from sidewalk to skyline. Founded in 1970, the Historic Districts Council is the citywide advocate for New York's historic <laughs> neighborhoods and buildings. HDC works with a constituency of over 500 community-based organizations to preserve, protect, and enhance the physical character of New York City's irreplaceable historic places. Founded in 1980, Village Preservation works to document, celebrate, and preserve the special architectural and cultural heritage of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo. Village Preservation has successfully advocated for the landmark designation of more than 1,250 um, buildings in, our neighborhood, in their neighborhoods and has helped secure zoning protections for nearly 100 blocks. Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District is a membership organization dedicated to preserving and celebrating the architectural legacy livability and sense of place in Manhattan's Upper East Side. Established in 1982 after the community's successful designation of the Upper East Side Historic District, Friends Purview now encompasses 131 individually designated landmarks and seven historic districts for a total of 1,907 protected buildings. And since 1985, Landmark West has worked to achieve landmark status for individual buildings and historic districts on the Upper West Side in Manhattan and to protect them from insensitive change and demolition. They're the proud stewards of more than 3,200 designated architectural and cultural landmarks from 59th Street to 110th Street, Central Park to Riverside Park. Joan D Davidson has supported all of our organizations in a variety of ways, serving as an official director or advisor, guiding policy, convening leaders, and leading the way. We're honored to have the opportunity tonight to highlight her achievements and work, and we're very pleased to have two of our favorite people to guide us through this history. Anthony C. Wood is a preservationist, author, teacher, historian, and grant maker. Currently the executive director of the Idelson Foundation, he has worked for the J.M. Kaplan Fund, the New York Landmarks Preservation Commission, and the Municipal Arts Society. For over 20 years, he was a member of the adjunct faculty of the Historic Preservation Program of the Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. Tony is the author of Preserving New York, Winning the Right to Protect the City's Landmarks, the founder and chair emeritus of the New York Preservation Archive Project, and veteran of more preservation boards and campaigns than decency is allowed to disclose. Roberta Brandis Gratz is an award-winning journalist and urban critic, lecturer, and author of several books, including the the one that we will be discussing tonight, and the now classics, The Living City, Thinking Small in a Big Way, and Cities Back from, an, from the Edge, New Life for Downtown. Ms. Gratz is an international lecturer on urban development issues and former award-winning reporter from the New York Post back when it was a real newspaper. She was, apported, uh, she was appointed by Mayor Michael Bloomberg um, to the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission in 2003 and served with distinction until 2010 when she resigned and was appointed to, uh, by the mayor to serve on the Sustainability Advisory Panel for Plan NYC. She has served on numerous planning and preservation boards and task forces, public and private, in New York State and beyond. She is the founder of the Fire Island Historical Society and the Elger Street Museum. In 2005, in collaboration with Jane Jacobs, Ms. Gratz founded the Center for the Living City, an urbanist organization which works on a global scale to advance social, environmental, and economic justice. A piece of business before we, I turn it over to Tony and Roberta, which is please, you can use the chat or the questions. We will be monitoring them as we go on. Uh, this is being recorded. And so with that, I would like to 
turn it over to our to our stars, Tony Rivera. Thank okay. you so much for joining us. Thank you, Simeon, and thank you, our sponsors. Uh, and uh, Roberta, I've been looking forward to have an intimate chat with you and three or 400 of what Joan would call the good people, which was the term she liked to talk about for the, for the people that the fund supported over the years. And Tony, so, I, let me interrupt you. I've just been looking at the list of ch from chat and we not only are all over the country, we in ha include Lima, Peru, and a shout out to some very old friends, Susan Meyer and Claudia Polly from my childhood. I tell you, Roberta, your fans <laughs> are legion and everywhere. Well, for those of you who haven't done your homework, I e. read the book, which is prominently displayed behind me here for a product placement. Uh, briefly, what this book does is it captures the stories of the inspiring individuals and intrepid organizations that with the support of the Kaplan Fund helped New York transition through the 50s, recover from the 70s and evolve ever since. It explores the fund's signature philanthropic approach perfected by Joan Davidson, which allowed the foundation to punch above its weight through deeply informed grant making, a willingness to be a risk taker, eagerness to support innovation, a talent for betting on the jockey, not the horse, a belief in grassroots and community-based efforts, all of this done with a point of view about what was important for New York and New York State. As the book vividly demonstrates, the fund's interests went way beyond preservation, but for tonight's audience, we wanna focus primarily, but not exclusively on preservation. So we've kind of organized our conversation three parts tonight. The first is exploring in a little more depth some of the stories that are captured in the book. Then the second is, in a sense, extracting from what's in the book some, no some knowledge, ideas, inspirations, things that might help New York as once again New York is, an, is in a crisis, just as it was in the 70s. Uh, and the tendency often is to go for a silver bullet project or build our way out of a problem. And this book really talks about another approach, a different approach to helping bring New York alive and helping us rethink how New York gets back on the track after COVID. So Roberta, uh, I don't know if you wanna make a, an introductory statement before I start on jumping in with some questions. So I'm gonna give you a, a chance for that. Otherwise I'm ready to go. Well, I think uh, I'd like people to understand that um, uh, this book is really, um, it, it's, a, it, it's a valentine. It's a valentine to Joan. Uh, some of us a number of years ago were talking about her legacy is really not well known. And I happened to say there should be a book and here it is. But I think the thing about the book, I mean, as, as well as I sort of thought I knew Joan, having written news stories about her back in the 70s on, is that I never realized the full uh, gamut of what the fund supported. Uh, I came to know the fund through the preservation work that I was writing about, but the breadth of issues that Joan rose to is really extraordinary. And I make a point in the book is that a lot of it are from her part and yours, Tony, because you were so important on the staff, was instinct about people. Um, and these were good ideas uh, that needed uh, some support um, and didn't need a whole lot of studies and long papers. And I, and I think it's, that's an important issue about today because as we worry about the recovery from the pandemic, um, the, the experts and the officials at the top are all looking at the wrong things. It's not gonna be the next skyscraper. It's not gonna be the next uh, 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 unfortunate building in the wrong neighborhood. It's not gonna be about buildings. It's gonna be about people. And until we learn as Joan did, to um, value the energy and the ideas that is uh, the ferment of a city uh, and learn how to encourage them and invest in them. That's where the future of uh, the recovery will be. Okay, Robert, great. Uh, well, you mentioned that, that indeed you were surprised by the range of, of interests that the fund funded as you started this. 
But you know, you've worked with Joan for decades. You've been an unindicted co-conspirator with her on some wonderful projects. Uh, and you wrote about her many years ago, actually, I believe. So were there any other surprises as you kind of got deeper into it and looked at archival material and did all the interviews you did for the book? Was there any, uh, was there any surprise you learned about Joan? Well, um, among, among the, the big issues that I, uh, you know, worked with Joan on was the uh, fight to save the theaters in Times Squares, which we lost. And, uh, and, and the fight to save Westway, which I wrote about. Um, and she was a major funder of those lawsuits. I then discovered that there were lawsuits all through the years um, that the fund supported, which very few foundations were willing to do. And as we all know, anybody on this call who is uh, an, an activist knows that often it's the, the lawsuit that finally, um, you know, does the trick. And uh, without institutional support from foundations, they would not have happened. Uh, so there were those kind of things. I think I didn't realize how important the fund had been in um, the fight in the Hudson River Valley. Uh, and saving the Hudson and the fight against Con Ed and the birth of the Natural Resources and Defense Fund, uh, all critical issues, support for gay rights and uh, civil rights. Uh, I vaguely knew about these things, but I didn't know them well. And um, so the breadth of support and interest was quite remarkable and always again, uh, because she knew and staff knew you were investing in people, their ideas, their energy, and their commitment. And that did the trick. Well, you pointed out, I mean, the, the willingness of Joan and the fund to support legal efforts uh, really kind of is, makes them distinct. I think one of the other distinct things that I'd love to get you to comment on is, you know, most foundations run in the opposite direction of anything controversial, right? Yeah. Uh, yet the Kaplan Fund ran towards controversy when you go back to uh, JM's willingness to jump in and, and help fight Carnegie, to save Carnegie Hall, or uh, uh, wonderful Ray Rubinow, who was JM's kind of man on the grounds work uh, around Washington Square fighting Moses, uh, up, up through then the, the more recent things we know with the theaters and Westway. Uh, and so what, what do you think it is that made the fund and Joan willing to really jump into controversies where other foundations just wouldn't even think of it? Um, if I knew there were a gene or if there was something that we could bottle and, and pass around, um, I think this was a very particular way of looking at the city, of looking at people and of being open in a way that so many people aren't. And even among activists, uh, you know, uh, many of you who are on this call may have started an organization or an effort years and years ago. Uh, I did myself in, in the restoration of the Elder Street Synagogue when people told me I was crazy. What do you want to save a synagogue in Chinatown, an old synagogue in Chinatown for? And but ever all these people, including Joan, knew how to block out the naysayers. Uh, if you believed in something, you just had to stick with it. And you needed, we all need some kind of support of which Joan was an important uh, purveyor um, to keep us going. Uh, when I worked on Elder Street, the Kaplan Fund was the, and the Astor Found Foundation who often worked together. They were my first uh, donors and, and it was a shot of confidence. Uh, and it's really just persistence. And uh, you needed, if, if you were one of those people and many of you may now be those people who are gonna be fighting for the, the rebuilding of ours and many other cities represented on this call, um, 
you it, hopefully you will find somebody who will give you just enough support to know that someone else beside you believes in what you're doing and you just keep going. And Joan provided that. Well, you know, not only was the fund willing to go into controversies, but what I also found remarkable was, was the foundation and Joan was willing to actually be even more out front than, than certain organizations. I mean, when it came to the theaters, when it came to Westway, the fund and Joan was on board even before many of the organizations that the fund had supported for years had come to those positions. And so that, to me, that's just another fascinating dimension to kind of the leadership role. Absolutely. And she was never afraid to go to the boards that she served on to say, hey, you guys, you should be on this and uh, you, sh you should be on the right side of this. And sometimes they were and that sometimes they weren't. And there's no need to you know, get into the particulars. But the fact is she had the courage to confront her very own friends and uh, allies. Um, and this is something, it, this is a matter of standing up for something and being willing to, if anything, in a way, embarrass your friends that they're in the wrong place uh, and not uh, doing what is, what is appropriate. In New York, like every other city, uh, people worry about the, the people in the establishment. What are they gonna think? Is this gonna cost me political points? Is this gonna you know, get me thrown off that committee or not invited to that event? It's, it's part of everyday life. And Joan, fortunately, because of her own position in the city, could turn her back on all of that and say, uh, I don't care, uh, this is right. And, um, and she did that. And, and it started with you know, her, her father, I tell the story of the saving of Carnegie Hall. Um, and at one point, Joan said, do you think my father even cared about Carnegie Hall? You think he even went to a concert there? Of course not. But Isaac Stern came to him and said, I need your help. I need your help. We have to save Carnegie Hall. And he understood what Carnegie Hall represented. It was up against the building of Lincoln Center, where at a time when the powers that be thought the city could not handle more than one performance space, and that was gonna be Philharmonic Hall. So Carnegie Hall was expendable. And Isaac, said, Isaac Stern made the strong case that one could make again today of how it is the preeminent hall internationally. He, you, you hadn't made it in uh, the music, particularly music world, um, if you hadn't performed in Carnegie Hall. And today we know what a treasure it is. So it started, that's in the 60s. That's yeah. really before a lot of the uh, preservation energy. This oh, was yeah. not a preservation um, uh, effort. This was just a good old fashioned uh, effort uh, to save an iconic uh, performance space. Well, you mentioned uh, that, you know, you didn't think JM had ever been to a concert there, but certainly Alice would have been. And I think, in a sense, when you talk about Carnegie Hall, I, I think also it, it, it makes the point that Alice was also involved um, and, and played a role and, and uh, you know, maybe doesn't, doesn't get quite the billing she, she should with, with some of what the fund got involved with. Well, I think that's true. And I tried to give her credit um, or at least uh, show where, she, where I, I knew that she was involved. Um, for example, in the music world, she was the musical con connection. She was supporting uh, programs at the new school. Uh, she had a, a real interest in music. So she was very much part of the response to Isaac Stern. She was also a great art collector and she worked on the Fine Arts Federation, I think it was that she started. I wrote it, it's all in the book. But she was very much there. and. One, one of uh, their children said to me in an interview, she was the one who gave JM class. She was the cultured one, JM was not.
Gotcha. Well, we've talked about some of kind of the marquee issues that Joan and the fund was was involved with, but there's this whole other dimension of, of the fund's work where, I mean, it was willing to fund, you know, Richard George saving the beachside bungalows, uh, you know, a, 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 not, a, not a marquee issue then. Hope, hopefully it's going to become one because it's still a, a live issue out there, uh, but, but also the, the larger things and, and kind of showing that awareness of the importance of activity at all levels in the city. Uh, and I, I'm wondering how, how do you think Joan came to, to have that appreciation for the, for the grassroots, for the, for the neighborhood level of, and the importance of that in, in what was going on in the city? I don't know that she came to understand the grassroots issue. I think she must have from an early age um, understood how to um, listen to people and appreciate what they were saying. You had to be open. Um, you know, it's it's a real weakness today that we meet a stranger and you don't automatically listen to what that stranger says. Um, but Joan did. And by the way, since you mentioned uh, the Rockaway Cottages, everybody who has the book has to look up that story because you will not know it, but you will understand. This is a classic story where a small grant, I think it was $15,000 to plant some trees, started an effort with, where uh, it was the one area in uh, along the Rockaway Beach that did not flood during Sandy. And it's been ruined since, although hopefully will be repaired. It is a classic case of how uh, bureaucracy can destroy what local people do instinctively right. Um, and yet no official agency has learned anything from that story. So it's a, it's, and yet it's classic Joan because this, this is out in Far Rockaway with little cottages that nobody even knew about. And all they wanted was trees. And it was an easy yes. And it led to a whole uh, development along the water's edge that protected this little area from the floods. And it's a very important story. And it's classic Kaplan because of how small it is and significant. And the impact was big. You know, another thing that I think might be considered classical, uh, classic Kaplan approach, and I want to kind of move to strategy for a minute. Uh, you write about the, the fight over St. Bart's, and, and you point out that uh, so the fund was involved in that specific effort to try and save that threatened, you know, religious sacred site. But at the same time, it was tackling the larger problem by helping launch the sacred sites program at the Landmarks Conservancy. It was helping start the national organization, the partners uh, for sacred places. So it kind of got involved in an issue at multiple levels, some reactive, some kind of proactive. And you know, I think that type of thinking was probably involved in some of the other efforts. So I don't know if you want to, if there's anything else that illustrates well kind of that strategy of, of being involved at multiple levels of an issue? Well, it's a very important point and a great example because it was not just about a singular issue. It was never about just a singular issue. Um, and, and we all know that in the preservation world, something is, that's never been appreciated. And this is, you know, what I've written books about. Preservation isn't about singular buildings. It's about the larger city itself and what is of value in terms of the urban environment. So Joan would see something not just as a singular issue, but what its multiple uh, impacts would be with St. Bart's what it meant was there was a weakness in defending religious properties, religious landmarks. Um, and that led to the, the founding of sacred sites um, and in New York and in, in Philadelphia, because these were issues that were coming up around the, the country. And how did you, how, how do you, uh, protect and think about religious issues. I think also um, what 
what always appealed to me uh, because it fit in with my own view of urban development is that, uh, and I've written this in prior books, the, the green markets, for example, the green markets were the key to the restoration of the neighborhood that they were born in. I mean, if you know what happened after the, each green mark stop, uh, started and the impact in the surrounding neighborhood, um, it was enormous. And Joan recognized this. Officials do not understand what the local energy can do because it always has to be um, official policy or some such thing or developers. Developers don't understand any of this and they don't support any of this. They are predators. They come in after the regeneration has started and they take advantage of it. They're never there in the beginning, but they often get written, written about as the heroes because no one is writing about what, what happened before. Uh, uh, so this is what makes me crazy. And, I, and since uh, all you sponsors are preservationists, one of the things that I always like to say is um, the real estate industry, top to bottom, opposed every designation along the way in the, from the beginning. They, I remember sitting in Landmarks Commission hearings and listened to the, this garbage about how it was gonna be the end of the world, Ladies Mile in Brooklyn, wherever it was. And then every one of these uh, designations, particularly the, uh, the districts, every one of them succeeded, every one of them. I defy anyone to show me one that failed. And what happened after success? Then came the developers, the predators, taking advantage of the success that they um, uh, argued against. So what makes Joan's approach so valuable is being able to recognize where those early germs of change really uh, need a little um, uh, assistance and not think that it's gonna be some publicly funded big time project because they are never the ones that uh, bring about positive change. If anything, uh, they snuff it out. Well, Roberta, I think you've just dampened our book sales to Rebney in the real estate community, but we'll, we'll just have to live with that. They don't uh, listen, they don't listen, they don't wanna listen. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the green markets because that's kind of a, a segue to a question I wanted to ask. And you pointed out the value of the green, mar green markets to their neighborhoods, but the green markets also became a, a boost for the, the farmers and the people in the valley on places bringing, bringing in. And where the segue is, is again, Joan and the fund, I think were, were probably unique and certainly in the forefront and still we need progress there of, of people who saw the connection that the that you know, oftentimes there seemed to be a tension between people who just fund historic preservation or people who do land conservation and kind of this tension between the, the greens and the building people. And the fund uh, bridged that. I mean, the fund, you know, just the way it helped historic districts in the city, it helped land trusts blossom all over New York state. Uh, and like the Rural New York program brought together all of those interests. And so, uh, you know, in terms of Jones, seeing that connectivity. I know uh, when I was at the fund and, and we started Rural New York and she sent me upstate New York. I mean, she, she was singing the praises of upstate New York before most people in New York City knew it existed. I mean, she yeah. basically put the Hudson Valley on the map in a sense for, for New Yorkers. But where did that come from? How did, how did Joan get to, to see the connectivity uh, there between city and rural and downstate and upstate, that, that linkage? Well, she often said, or I don't know about often, but she has said that a lot of the upstate, the purchase of land uh, around the watershed and, uh, and even looking <clears throat> at rural areas upstate stemmed from her father's interest in, uh, in the uh, Welsh's grapefruit, uh, grape juice and the um, 
collective uh, that he supported of uh, grape growers in uh, upstate New York. So I think that came, uh, that openness started uh, with her father, but um, she realized it was the same story um, in some small town, which you discovered in your uh, poetic writings about discovering that, you know, there was uh, life a after uh, the New York City border upstate um, on how one small project could be the catalyst for a larger development uh, in a place, whether it's the restoration of the library, whether it's the conversion of a historic building into senior housing. Um, any one of these projects often became the catalyst for growth around uh, uh, that community. Um, and that was no different from what she saw happening in New York, but the up, the, the pull up state, I think started with her own connection, her father's connection. And then a matter of, of uh, you know, responding to people uh, upstate as she did locally. Uh, the, the person had to be something of an inspiration to Joan. She recognized the determination, uh, the willingness to really work hard, uh, the caring that people ex um, exhibited when they were fighting for a local issue or place. Uh, and she understood that was worth investing in. That's what we need today. There are people out there during COVID who are doing all sorts of things from home that eventually might have uh, be, want the opportunity to take that out of home and uh, put it in an empty storefront or develop it further. I don't know where the support for all of that is going to happen, but you know this is how the '70s were the catalyst for the rebuilding of the city. None of this was obvious. Whether it was people organizing. Um, uh, neighborhood watches, planting flower boxes, uh, having uh, street fairs, doing things that created community. This is what the strength was that rebuilt New York from its, its depths in the 70s. And we have to find what's comparable today uh, going forward now that some of us are starting to get our vaccines and life has a chance of resuming in the next couple of months. Um, let's get creative and let's get officials to open their eyes and be creative and not look to the developer to make one more building we don't need. Uh, you know, you. I just want to underscore the point you made. I think Joan is certainly kind of the ultimate talent scout when it comes to, you know, looking for, for people who are, are making things happen and have the possibility, the ability to, to do that. But I'm glad you, you we've gotten, kind of begun our pivot here to, to looking to the future. And in a sense, are there any particular stories in the book that, that are worth lifting up that might provide particular inspiration as, as we look to, to the future that jump to mind? Uh, I mean, I, I think that you know, the, the big theme, I think, is that it, it's a Jane Jacobs approach, right? It's lots of small innovations and activities at a certain level that, that are what, what's needed. But are there any particular ones that, that you think we should kind of keep in mind as, as we're looking ahead? Um, no, uh, because I think they all have a message for different people. Uh, everybody will pick their favorite. Um, but at the heart of every one of those stories is a person. It's not a place, it's not a building, it's not a thing. It's somebody who believed in something. Even the small park movement, people don't realize that the first uh, mini, uh, what did we call them? The mini parks. Yeah, best pocket parks. Best pocket parks started uh, on 103rd street uh, with money from the fund. and. 
uh, Bobby Kennedy and John Lindsay came to see it as success. And before you knew it, the Vest Pocket Park idea was spreading around the city and around the country. There were so many things that started in New York that spread around the country, but they started by an individual or a group of individuals. It can't be, uh, you know, people can come along and say, well, you know, you really should do X, Y, Z. Don't tell us what anybody else should do. Roll up your sleeves and get in there and fight for it. And God knows, having experienced this myself over a 20 year period, there are days when you don't believe it's gonna happen and you just push forward. Sadly, I don't know who the Joan Davidsons are today. I mean, the fund is clearly still very much alive and doing fabulous things, um, but it's a different uh, it, it, it's a different community of funders than it was back then. I don't know who how many are open uh, to the new small creative things uh, that need that have not been proven by anybody. So they need to be uh, supported uh, and fought for. I mean, that's that's the whole issue. It's individual based, it's locally based, and there's a commitment that keeps people going. And sooner or later, you begin to see um, a, uh, you know, an impact. And um, I see on, on our, uh, among our uh, attendees is an old friend and mentor of mine who gave me a very smart um, piece of advice. And it's Ron Schiffman, hi Ron. Uh, and way back in the seventies when we were um, observing things that were happening in the South Bronx, all of which I wrote about in Living City and how the South Bronx was reborn through the groups that uh, were saving their communities. Um, and there were one or two failures and Ron uh, dubbed them failure with value because the failure it was failure, but while it was going, it gave birth to new similar things. And it was the acorns after uh, off the failed oak tree that blossomed into the neighborhoods that are reborn today. So failure with value um, is something that we need to appreciate more uh, because not everything succeeds, but that doesn't mean there wasn't value in the effort. And sometimes uh, the effort may succeed, but the people involved become involved in something else. None of these efforts are without value. And I think in, uh, on that same point, Roberta, I think you know the, the fund and some of its efforts also realize some issues and some battles are so important that they're worth losing. I mean, in a sense that even if you know the odds are against you, it's, it's, it's morally important to take a stand because you don't know what will come from it, but somebody has to be willing to do that. Uh, we're gonna kind of begin to segue here to, to some questions. Um, uh, you've actually answered several of them, Roberta. I'm either you've been looking at the Q&A list on the side or you're just prescient. No, as I always. Just names. <laughs> but also I should point out in the chat that uh, we had a message from Joan who is up at Midwood and in, enjoying uh, watching and, and listening to, to all of this. So wonderful, Joan. I'm, I'm glad you're visiting technicians up there have managed to Zoom you into tonight's program. Uh, we, we feel your presence and it's, it's really wonderful to, to know you're part of this evening. Um, so uh, looking at, at some questions, uh, it's, it's interesting, and I don't know if you want to go there, but um, the upcoming mayor's race, uh, you know, are there lessons, you know, and again, inspired by, by what the fund helped make happen in the past and those groups and those people, um, how, how do we raise the issues that, that you've touched on? How, how do we get the predator developer recognized as a predator developer? I mean, is there, 
uh, how do we reach, make those issues vibrate to more than the 349 people presently on our call? Uh, it's a really good question because I don't know. I feel that today New York is in the clutches of the real estate industry worse than it has ever been. And um, I don't know how we get around that. Um, they, there's, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm gonna watch. I, I have no preferences yet. I'm gonna listen to everybody. I've been disappointed so many times. Hell, I even voted for de Blasio. What a mistake that was. So um, it's, I think it would, it, the only thing I can say is that all of you people and anyone else who has a favored candidate needs to have that conversation with the candidates. How can you overcome the power of the real estate industry? They have been wrong on the issues of what makes New York great, uh, what gives it its, its uh, personality and its rebirth. Um, they, have, they don't have credibility, but they have money and they have power. So I don't know how to do that, Tony. I think this is gonna be a very interesting race to watch. There's some good people who are throwing their hat in the ring, but none of them are known to me as being, um, you know, courageous when it comes to developers. You know, unfortunately, that's where the money is. So the question is, how do they uh, work with developers or take their money um, and under what, what conditions? Because they're all going to take their money. Nobody's going to uh, not take their money. I just... Uh, you know, maybe I'll be surprised, and I don't, I don't know. But um, there are some good people in the development community who know uh, what's wrong, um, but it, they are not in the leadership. They are not at the voices that are heard, and they need to be nurtured um, to be on our side instead of on the side of just the big money. Absolutely, we have a. A question that came up kind of uh, focusing us for a, a little bit on on the role that Joan and the fund have played up in the Hudson River Valley uh, and and besides the total colonization of the area around Midwood by Davidson family members uh, I, I know there have been other major impacts that Joan's involvement in the fund's involvement has had up there from land trusts to arts and the like. And Roberta, I mean, what's what's your thinking on kind of the impact that, that the fund has had up there and Joan has had? It got me there. <laughs> I, well, she, it didn't exist until Joan was there. I, I know that's totally wrong. Well, uh, I write in the book, there was a, uh, a bus trip organized um, by the fund, uh, Joan's idea. Uh, to get some New York people uh, from the press and otherwise, I was still uh, in at or just coming out of being at the New York Post, though it was 1978. And it was like, um, we're going to explore what, what there is in the Hudson Valley. And it opened the eyes of all of us to the treasures that were there you know, who had been north of the Bronx? Um, not too many people. Um, and she herself bought this incredible uh, Midwood on, on the Hudson, uh, where she brought so many of us to visit. Um, and uh, yes, she started, she saw the, the potential in Columbia County um, as she had seen it in New York City. And yes, the land trusts are very important up there, as are other things, um, particularly people's attention. So, um, and one of the comments, I, I just had uh, been able to glance at a few, uh, was mentioned how Joan used to have soirees where people could meet and socialize and just talk about the issues of the day. We need more of that kind of gathering. Um, to talk about these things in a way that uh, lights the fire in the belly of all of us, because I don't think there's anyone on this call who hasn't been involved in some kind of uh, issue, fight, or whatever. Uh, and 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 it's up to 
all of us to light that fire uh, again today. Um, so I think she did it wherever she went and uh, upstate is one place and a lot of these ideas then spread elsewhere. Well, I think you, you I mean, the fund and Joan have, have played a great role over time as a great convener and also bringing kind of bring cross pollinating between groups, between issues. And I think that's, you know, that's again, a kind of a, an important distinction of the fund. And uh, I think that one of the things about Joan uh, was that she was open to learn. For example, I mean, she brilliantly led the, uh, uh, the development of Westbeth way back in the, um, in the seventies, but, she said that when she first heard about Westway, she thought her reaction was, oh, it was going to go right in front of Westway. That would be terrible. But then, as she said, she listened to the lawyers who explained to her all the issues that were involved and came to realize that Westway was a fight for the city. It was a fight to decide whether the future was about cars or about trans transit. Um, and she learned as she went along, but she was open to learning, to, to see, to go from the particular to, to the general. Um, and I think that's very important. Uh, that's something that is not very common um, and you know it needs to be nurtured, but uh, it's a particular talent uh, that took her in many places. Um, and I mean, I won't go into it, but the whole story of the Hudson Valley and even the uh, saving of the New York City watershed, people don't understand uh, how critical the fund and Joan was in the, the uh, saving of New York City's water and the watershed. Um, it's a great story, but it had got no publicity at the time. Her, her role was not recognized. And that's part of the reason I wrote this book. Joan was involved in many of the issues that I have been writing about, six books about, and but not recognized as being critical to those issues. So my goal was to show where she played a role in some of the stories that we either do or do not know about. Um, but there's a lot in there that surprised me in that respect. Um, and I think will surprise a lot of people. Uh, I'm gonna jump in with a housekeeping, uh, just a, re a reminder to the 338 people who are still with us, uh, go to the Q and A function on that little bar at the very bottom of your screen. If you do have a question, it's better to pop it in there than to put it into the chat. It's a better chance of catching our attention. Uh, one of the questions that's come up, uh, and I know it, the, the focus of this book is really the, the fund and JM's period up, up through, through Jones, but you also had a chance to talk to a lot of the, the, what, the, the cousins generation and, and uh, I think even some of the, maybe the, what we call the gen four, the next gen. And so one of the questions was kind of, how has the fund evolved post Joan? And, uh, you know, there's, as you pointed out, you know, it's kind of like, is there a gene, you know, is there a DNA component? But it, it seems that a lot of the, uh, the, the defining features of the fund, the same willingness to take risks, to be an informed grant maker, to, you know, bet on the jockey, not the horse, be there where it's important. Those seem to be, you know, inbred in, in the fund as it's gone forward. But since you had some conversations with current leaders of, of the fund, what, what's your thinking on that? I, I think it is a gene. Um, I, I mean, all of the, the, the kids and, and the cousins and the ones that I spoke to, I think they all have the same instinct. Um, they have different interests, different directions, and it's a different time. Uh, you know, we're talking about um, the, the 20th century uh, for Joan, but now it's the 21st century and they're recognizing different issues that are um, perhaps as early as they were, uh, as some of the issues were that when Joan um, was funding. I don't follow uh, the current fund uh, issues as much as I knew about Jones, 
But from what I've seen, um, I think they have the same instincts. They're doing some very innovative things. Um, and thank God they're still here uh, and, and, and continuing that tradition of, uh, you know, finding what's important um, in perhaps uh, in yet to be discovered. And, and I have to say, just as slight segue, I, I glanced at one of the questions. Um, this is not just a New York phenomenon. Uh, and I know a lot of you are representing cities all over the country from Cincinnati to San Francisco and wherever. Um, there are people locally in every place. I've seen it having written about different places all around the country. There are, hopefully, there are usually people with a creative idea and energy and they may not have a, a funder. Um, they may even be able to, you know, raise small amounts of money, but it's, it, it's a way of thinking and viewing the world around you uh, from a very local uh, perspective, I'm not expecting the big money, not expecting the state, the, the stadium, or the, uh, or you know the the new um, arena or whatever it is to be your savior. They will never be a savior. They have never been. They don't. They are not known to be. Uh, you know, generators of rebirth, they're usually part of the process, but not the catalyst for the process. And I don't think it's just a New York thing. We just happen to have been lucky in New York um, to have uh, Joan and the fund at, the, at, at a critical time and continuing into the present. Oh, Robert, I'm glad you, you saw that question. It, it comes from a, a, a young innovator who's doing work in Charleston. And Charleston, South Carolina is indeed facing a, a lot of uh, challenges that New York has been through in terms of pressure on historic neighborhoods and resources. So I'm, I'm, uh, several copies of the book have gone down to Charleston. We'll, we'll hopefully see if it, if it you know, leads to something there. Uh, one of the questions that com comes up, and it's a kind of a fun, uh, it, it shows again kind of cross pollinization. Uh, is Jones always been dedicated to books? And when it comes to the historic preservation side, you know, the fund, as you pointed out, uh, basically published a whole series of books helping focus attention, whether it was Ladies Mile or Sunnyside or, I mean, or, I mean, which was, but, and then Jones' interests have even now crystallized in around furthermore for so much and her support of writers. And so I know you, that that's something you focused on a bit. Any, any thoughts on kind of that, that where that came from? Why, why the, the printed word, the power of, of publications has really resonated so much for Joan and been reflected in the, in the fund's work? Um, I don't know where it came from. Uh, that's a good question, Joan. Someday we should talk about this, but it certainly is an old, feeling of hers. Um, and the interesting thing is for all of you preservation organizations uh, on this call or otherwise, um, that uh, the beginning of all of these efforts usually had uh, some kind of pamphlet, a fund sponsored pamphlet that was very helpful in, in the uh, whatever the fight was. I think it's even more important today. When I was writing about preservation and neighborhood stuff in the 70s um, at, at the Post, there were seven newspapers when I started in, in the late 60s. Uh, there were seven newspapers. We don't have the printed word to spread the word that, um, uh, of what's going on. Fortunately, we do have the internet and it's very important that these stories get out and that people learn about what's happening in different places because every story is an inspiration to somebody else. So those pamphlets and books have always been very important. Um, and I think today uh, it now is also the internet. Absolutely, the so social media is, is where so much of it is. Um, there's a question that, that, that's uh, on the board here about uh, kind of public-private partnerships, and, and the fund was very involved in, in helping get a lot of the uh, park-related ones off the ground. Uh, but you know, there, 
the, the question kind of suggests that, you know, what some of those public private partnerships have been problematic uh, as, as, a, as a model and kind of what's your thing on, on that as a, as a model and as a, as a vehicle going forward in the city. So I have a thing about public-private partnerships, partnerships. Most of them, as far as I'm concerned, are private, uh, private projects with public funding. It's not like uh, there was a time when uh, there was private support for some of the neighborhood-based uh, organizations but the neighborhood-based organizations were still in the driver's seat. A public-private partnership today, in most cases, is a fraud, as far as I'm concerned, because it's, it's, it's a private um, endeavor with public money. Unless the local people, the, the drivers of the project are really in charge, then I would accept public-private partnership. But that's a definition, um, you know, which has lost meaning uh, today. So um, I would be very cautious uh, what I call a public-private partnership and with whom and at what cost. Uh, it, you know, here's the problem. From day one, the way back in the days I remember uh, watching in the South Bronx, these new ideas, these bubbling up creative ideas led by local people, they sort of have a shelf life because once they become successful, the big boys come in or government comes in with big wrong money um, and the, the spirit and the leadership um, changes and is often lost. So um, I, the, term, the terms are too easy. Um, and you have to ask even whatever the term is, uh, whatever the designation is, what does it really mean uh, to, to understand if it is legitimately a partnership or whether it's um, a private uh, developer or in, uh, entity uh, tagging on and taking advantage of a local um, effort. Uh, there's a switching gears a little. There's a, both a comment in the chat and the question, which which is deals with the fact that you know, in addition to the fund and Joan being able to provide funding, uh, Joan also provided so much kind of support, you know, in terms of confidence and, and, and enthusiasm that she exuded towards people's projects. And, and the, 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 the question said, we should point out that, that Joan still does this, which is so true. I mean, to this very day, you know, she gives people that, that sense of, of what they're doing is important, that somebody else cares. And I think one of the nice things about the fund was even, even if the fund wasn't able necessarily to fund something, that the interaction with the fund was always positive for somebody in terms of knowing someone was willing to listen. And I think one of the great things that I always felt about Joan, which, which uh, I, I was not able to emulate, is Joan could hear someone present an idea that she might have heard 20 times before over the years, and she still was able to listen fresh to it and be open to it and be you know, supportive at least in letting somebody know what they were doing was important, whether or not it was something that the fund could, could get involved with. So there is that spirit around Joan and that kind of generosity and warmth. And you've seen it, Roberta, but I mean, that's, that, where does well, that come? Is, is, that, is that? This is something also that other people can learn from. Um, we, need to, we need to encourage each other. Um, I, I mean, when I was struggling in the early days at, at, the, at Eldridge, um, sure, uh, Joan and Linda Gillies at Astor were like my good housekeeping seals of approval, officially. 
But there were people who would come and say, Roberta, what you guys are doing are just, just great. Do you know how important this is? And, and I, I, it was so meaningful to me, struggling as we were, to hear from other people. Not, it was not about money. It was just, just about believing in what we were doing. And we all can do that for other people. Um, that That's not a unique to Joan. It's just that what she did was very important in that regard. But there are a lot of things, uh, a lot of the qualities about uh, Joan that you'll read in the book that, uh, that are not um, absent from other people. Fortunately, she had the fun behind her to put her money where the mouth was. Um, but we all can do that to some extent. Um, and uh, I think it's very important uh, as much as, you know, I care about what I've written about Joan, I don't want it to sound like Joan is the only person in the world who exhibits the kind of smart uh, behavior and sensitive behavior that was so important in the, the rebirth of New York in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and whatever. Um, I want people to learn from Joan that uh, what you can do to be helpful to other people. Sometimes it's even writing a small check. Um, and it doesn't, the, the, the thing about the funds uh, financial support was often very small. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's critical for people to understand that sometimes, uh, somebody coming in with a small check is, if anything, it's a spiritual lift. Um, and oh, we yeah. all can do that. And we have to do it if we want New York to recover. Well, though, and I, I think that's so true when we said, I said earlier that the fund punched above its weight. I mean, it was, some of those grants were five, 10, 15,000, but they were, at the, they were to the right people at the right moment for the right idea. And, that, and that's what, what leveraged it. Uh, well, speaking about at the right moment, um, we've now kind of come to what's supposed to be the end. I'm a great believer in leaving people wanting more as opposed to giving them more than they want. But I'm gonna turn to Simeon to see if he wants to have the privilege of, of the spokesperson for the groups to ask any burning question he has or whether he wants to wrap this up and send us all home. So Simeon, it's, it's back to you. You're too kind, Tony, as always, uh, putting me on the spot like that. I think that one of the things that, uh, and I would really like to hear both of you just address um, is, as you said, the, the fund has done such a great job and Joan's leadership has done such a great job of catalyzing and creating these organizations um, like our colleagues all here, but what can we do? What, what is the next step, do you think? You know, we've got um, 300 people who, who have tuned in. Uh, between us all, we're a, a terrifying number of decades of work, but um, we still, uh, we're never gonna face, you know, the, uh, our, the opposition is always going to be able to outgun us with regards to money, but uh, do you have any suggestions from, you know, how to best uh, catalyze things or really continue that work? So, uh, Simeon, to some of the people on this call, it's gonna sound like a broken record because this has been my mantra from my first book. Small things matter. Individual people matter. Uh, and we can't be suffocated by the rhetoric of political and financial readership, uh, leadership um, who says otherwise. We know what's right. They don't necessarily know what, they don't know what's right. And we may or may not educate them. And educating them is not the issue. Just moving forward, whatever you do. Look, for you sponsoring organizations, I watched all of you week after week testify before the Landmarks Commission. No, no big shot was listening to you. We listened to you at the commission, but you had done your homework. You knew your issues. You were right. And you knew you were right. You didn't always win, 
but you were right. Um, and that's what people have. There are people on this call who are involved in all kinds of efforts. You know you're right. And you may be discouraged because none of the big boys are going to listen to you until you've really moved the, the chess on the chessboard, so to speak. And even then, when they recognize you, they'll try to take over. So just do your thing and um, put one foot in front of the other. And it's those small steps that lead to big, uh, you know, big things. Uh, and, you know, my books are filled with stories all over the country and, and even abroad of success stories. Um, I, I just can't say it often enough uh, for people to really have the inspiration to know they're doing the right thing and they got to just keep trying. And if you lose, something will be gained in the process. I, I will be very brief. I think the lessons that we need to keep following stand up for principle, fight the good fight even when the odds are against you, be courageous, and then be willing to sue the bastards if you need to. Uh, and I think that's, sadly, I think that's where so many of us are. And I'm so delighted myself to see so many of the groups on this call being willing to go into court to say this project is wrong. And, and have the guts to do it and the willingness to find the money to do it. So hats off to all of you who are in court. Stay there and win. And, and if you don't win, know you've done something important. Yep. The worst thing is to know that there's something worth doing and not doing it. Um, I've, I've been involved in winners and I've been involved in losers. And there's always a lesson in the loss um, so, uh, I think that's, you know, I hate, I hate to sound so preachy, <laughs> but, um, but I know I've just seen this so many times I've written all those stories and you all know those stories. Many of you have been involved in them, believe in them because they're right. Period. End of story. We believe in the gospel of grats. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's the gospel of all these people. And, and, and they just have to know they're in, what they're doing is the right thing and to keep doing it. Yeah. Well, thank you both so very, very much. Uh, this has been an enlightening and terrific evening um, and inspirational, uh, I know for myself and also from, we're getting a lot of comments. Um, Again, I would recommend to everybody watching this to please visit our websites, learn more about what's going on, learn how you can get involved and, uh, and do that small thing to help make the change and build the city and the place that we want to, uh, we want to live in the future. So um, I'd like to thank all my colleagues for all their terrific work on this and thank you all for spending some time with us. And thank you all. Yep. You're the troops. Thank you, Roberta, so much. And Tony, great to see everyone. Great to see you all.